So this potential approach is an alternative way to solve a mean field game system. And here we see a traditional or the prototypical mean field game system with the usual coupling through the measure M, a backward and forward coupling. And numerical schemes for these are really well understood. But now when we consider the price formation model, we add out of these uh, numerical schemes. We have now in this mean field game system, not only the backward and forward equations, but we have also an additional integral constraint. So what we do with this potential approach is how can we propose alternative ways to solve this model? And the solution is going to be both as an existence result, so there are solutions, but also in the numerical aspect, how to represent these solutions. The inspiration comes from a result called Poincaré lemma that you may be familiar, it's particularly useful in physics. There are several variations of this lemma. The most general one is for manifolds. And here I am just recalling a version from uh, calculus. And it says that whenever you have a vector field in R2 that satisfies a certain divergence condition, then you have in fact a scalar function whose gradient gives you back this vector. Field. And in physics, this lowercase g is what is called the potential. That's why we named this approach uh, the potential approach. In 2022, uh, Bakarian, a collaborator, uh, and other co collaborators use a uh, different version, but basically is the same structure of Juan Carelema in the mean field game planning problem. Just a small reminder that the planning problem is uh, the usual uh, uh, system of Hamilton, Jacobi, and transport equation, but now you have an initial condition for the measure and a terminal condition for the measure. There is no condition for the value function. And they used uh, this uh, Poincaré lemma for the planning problem. And we plan to uh, use the same approach with the remarkable difference that we remember have an integral constraint that you do not have in this planning problem. In our case, for the price formation system, we have this divergence structure. So we can apply a different version of Poincaré lemma to obtain a potential that, as you see, is defined up to a constant. It's uh, invariant under constants. Actually, you can give a physical interpretation of this potential if you consider this equation, because remember, m is for all times a t, a probability measure. So this equation is telling you that this potential is actually for each time t, the cumulative of the population. And that's a, a, a way to understand this potential. We're going to fix the constant by considering the initial condition for the measure in zero. Remember it's given. And actually we do know the potential when we have the solution of the mean field game system, we have this formula. What we want to do now is how can we invert this formula? How can I build the solution of the mean field game system out of the potential? And most importantly, how do I characterize this potential? What characterizes this function? So what we did in, in this paper, the one that is uh, already under submission, is to identify a variational problem for which this potential is a minimizer and under some conditions is unique. We take that problem and study the problem uh, uh, separately from the mean field gain. That means we want to know existence and uniqueness of minimizers for that variational problem. We also establish how to recover the mean field gain solution out of the potential. And finally, we showed that for the numerical aspects, it's easier to solve the mean field game system using the potential approach. Because as I'm going to show you, the potential approach, when you do the discretization, takes you to a finite dimensional convex optimization problem. And for that, you know, there are several standard tools like uh, Newton or interior points or alternative uh, and multipliers, there are several tools you, you can use. 
To introduce this uh, variational problem, let me start by considering the Lagrangian. As usual, you take the Hamiltonian that is given in the mean field game and consider its Lagrangian transform. The next uh, step to set up the variational problem is to consider a standard notion in variational analysis, which is uh, the perspective function. Here I'm showing the definition, but the most uh, remarkably properties is that it is convex and it's lower semi-continuous. And if you are familiar with variational approaches, this is exactly what you want because at some point you are going to take minimizing sequences and you want some sort of convergence for these minimizing sequences. Now, if we consider this uh, perspective function on the Lagrangian, as I introduced before, we can actually write the mean field game system using only the potential. Because remember here, we got these identities. So we can formally replace the mean field game system. And we are going to obtain the system of equations under these constraints. Notice that, for instance, a natural constraint is that the initial cumulative distribution is fixed, the same way it is fixed in the mean field game system. I want to understand what these equations represent for the potential. And we obtain that if you actually consider this function that notice is defined using the perspective function we introduced before, this set of equations is the Euler-Lagrange condition for this function. So it characterizes, if we show some convexity, it characterizes the minimizers of this function. But these are minimizers that satisfy this constraint. Because remember, we have the initial measure. And now here we are considering or we are obtaining the equivalent balance condition that, remember, is the third equation in this price formation mean field game system. But now it is written for the potential function. So what we want to do now is how can we study the existence and uniqueness of minimizers for this functional in the set of admissible functions that satisfy these constraints. To do that, we are going to take some preliminary results. From now on, we are going to assume that the initial condition for the measure is compactly supported. We do so because you have this uh, proposition that says basically whenever you take a transport equation whose vector field is reasonably well behaved, whenever you have an initial condition that is compactly supported, you have a solution that is compactly supported in your finite time horizon. And now we can switch. Uh, to the mean field game system and obtain using the previous result of the following. If you consider the solution M of the mean field game system, you can actually bound the support uh, for the time horizon using only constants that come from the problem data. What is the, the result or the, the advantage of this result? So far, I have been able to talk about the potential because I knew from the beginning that it's related to the mean field game solution through these equations. But if you want to set up this variational problem, you need to leave behind the solution of the mean field game system because you don't want to solve something that already has a solution. So this result here is allowing us to identify in particular a compact set to work and you can define this compact set independently of the solution of the mean field game system. You're just using problem data. In fact, we need a little bit more. So we take a constant that satisfies not only the previous condition, but also this additional condition, which is technical. We take this condition because we are going from now on to introduce some sets in which our candidates to minimizer uh, are going to, to be. 
but we need this set to be not empty. So we require this second condition and if, to define this compact set in which we are going to work. I'm going to introduce now the admissible set, taking uh, two sets in between. This is uh, somehow technical, but the takeaway here, I'm going to go through the lines, but the takeaway here is that you are going to introduce what you know or what you expect of this potential. That remember, it's a cumulative function, so you know it's non-negative, you know it's compactly supported. So we start with this uh, set where we are considering encoding the initial condition and the compact support. In the next set, we select, select the functions in the previous set that also satisfies for the instance, this density constraint, it's non-negative. That also satisfies here this notice that this initial condition is different here because here I is asking for this to be in W11. But here I'm asking to satisfy the condition at the initial time. And finally, the, uh, sorry, and the next one is the balance constraint is the one you saw before, but now I'm using the cumulatives. And finally, the constraint that says which we know that when you take the derivative with respect to x, remember this represents the measure m, and it must be a probability measure. Now the last requirement is to take the compact uh, the value sorry at the boundary to be zero. So just to give you a representation of these steps, you are enforcing the compact support. You are enforcing the density constraints. And finally, you are fixing the, the left-hand side of your distribution. Now we can move to the first uh, derivation, the, the first formulation, sorry, of the variational problem. And it says that if you have a Lagrangian that is convex and a terminal cost that is strictly convex, then this problem has at most what solution. So you obtain uniqueness uh, for free. And that's nice because remember, we are using here the perspective a function of the Lagrangian. And as I told you, it is convex. So this uniqueness uh, result basically comes for free. Now I want to jump is to the existence problem. We can prove uh, these bounds. And using these bounds, we can do some steps with minimizing sequence, sequences, which is at the end what you want to do. You want to take a minimizing sequence, show the sequence has a limit, and that limit is the minimizer. The issue is that this limit may not be admissible because we have bounds, uh, uniform bounds, sorry, in W11, but this weak limit may be a function BV, a function of bounded variation that may not be admissible. Now, the main issue here is the, ref the lack of reflexivity, basically. That's why we uh, land in this set uh, of functions of bounded variation. So what we plan to do now is to do a relaxation of the same problem in order to guarantee that the minimizer actually is admissible. To do that, let me introduce some additional notions. I'm going to denote by calligraphic M, the set of radon measures. These are measures that satisfy uh, certain conditions. In particular, they are, I guess it's called inner uh, regular and outer regular. So whenever you have a compact set, you can approximate its measures taking supremum, supremum of open sets from the inside or the infimum of closed sets from the outside. As I told you, I'm going to denote by BB the set of functions with bounded variation. And let's see here a brief on the structure of these functions. So you know that these functions have derivatives that are rather measures. And these measures can be decomposed 
as the sum of two parts. The first one is the Radonikovin derivative of this uh, measure with respect to the two dimensional. And in this case, remember we are in times, times space. And is the Radonikovin derivative with respect to the two dimensional Lebesgue measure plus a singular part. And in fact, you do know that this Radonikovin derivative is in L1. So here you see what is the issue with the functions of bounded variation. Why are not they all in L1? Well, because they may have this additional term that it's uh, the singular part. We switch to another a notion of convergence, which is the intermediate convergence, and is well suited to work with functions in BV. And it says that a sequence is going to converge in BV if you have convergence in L1 and convergence of the total variation. You are retaining the same structure as before because intermediate implies the weak convergence we were dealing in the previous uh, formulation. And you actually have, have these uh, density results. So you are identifying a, a good uh, setup to guarantee that now this minimizer is going to be uh, attained. As I did before, I'm going to introduce the new sets of admissible functions. This is basically the same, but the only and main difference is that you need this to make sense now for BB functions. So I'm going to start with the set and take the functions in BB whose derivative with respect to X is non-negative. But remember this comes from knowing that the derivative with respect to X is the measure in the mean figure. I'm going to penalize my initial functional from the previous uh, the, from the previous uh, setup. And I'm going to consider the lower semi-continuous envelope of this penalization. Now, for this um, lower semi-continuous envelope, you can show uh, that actually you preserve somehow the convergence of the minimizing sequences. And this is actually the, the standard approach you take in variational problems to preserve uh, these properties. What I'm going to show you now, it's basically a device to guarantee that our problem is well posed, and in particular to identify the new functional in the variational problem. So I'm going to take this expression that as you see here, comes from the previous formulation. And we are going to add here and subtract here the same quantity. But we do this because we can now consider these the functions, f sub n and f sub l. This exponent p is coming from the growth of the Lagrangian. And we can show that actually, if you consider the first part, which is the one that really poses the issue because it has the perspective function, this part is going to be equal to the perspective function. And whenever you see this tilde, it means the perspective function of that function. And remember, this is nice because the perspective function is convex and lower semi-continuous. And we can actually show more. We can show that if you take, as before, the lower semi-continuous functional of the penalization, it has this representation. What I just want to highlight in these equations is the following. First, that you are obtaining an explicit formula for this lower semi-continuous envelope, which is usually actually an infimum supremum. Second, that you are introducing the components that you do have in the BV uh, set. Remember that these functions of, funded, of bounded variation have this, this decomposition 
using red only coding derivatives. And that's what we need to put in the functionals to make this, uh, for this to make sense. And with this identity, we define the new functional for the relaxed variational problem. So this identity basically is giving us the right functional to consider in this set of functions with bounded variation. So as before, uh, we introduced the admissible sets. Basically, we, we follow the same path by taking the supports, taking the initial condition, the valence constraint. And we can actually show that if you consider the admissible sets of the previous problem, you have these, uh, these relations. So we know this one is not empty. We know the new one we are introducing here is also not empty. And we are finally in a position to obtain existence of minimizers in this relaxed uh, set. And that's how we obtain the existence. Moreover, if we have some regularity for this potential, because remember so far we are in BV, so we need some regularity to recover the mean field gain. We can show uh, the following results. The first one is this price that you have in the mean field gain system is actually a Lagrange multiplier for this variational problem as well. And actually this Lagrange multiplier is the derivative with respect to time of the price in the mean field gain system. So here you basically recover the derivative. But because you have the, this uh, terminal condition that characterizes this multiplier, you can recover back the price as an OD. And we have these identities, again, on the regularity. We do need this regularity to recover the solution of the mean field game system. Of course, uh, there is more work to do in the sense that here you're assuming regularity, which may not be expected for particular in first order mean field gains. So another part of the work that we plan to do in the future is how can we show that actually this solution in the relaxed variational problem gives you viscosity solutions and weak solutions for the transport equation without the need of having too much regularity. I'm going to illustrate this result with numerical uh, result, uh, sorry, uh, a numerical result for a linear quadratic game. So we take this Hamiltonian, a standard one. We take this function, remember that the Lagrangian here is basically the gen transform on H, but you have this potential in the Lagrangian as well. And just for simplicity, we take the terminal condition to be zero. We are going to assume that the supply, remember it's part of the problem data, satisfies this OD, which is oscillating. And this is just because when you do price formation models, the supply, remember, represents some kind of source of a commodity, for instance, energy and you may have or encounter this kind of oscillatory behaviors. The nice thing about this quadratic model is that you have benchmarks. So you can solve the hamilton jacob equation in the mean field system by considering these polynomial functions in X with time-dependent coefficients. It's somehow like a Riccati approach. And you actually have an explicit formula for the price using basically the supply. So with these benchmarks, uh, we are going to consider now the numerical results. On the left top in this plot, you see the analytical potential for the admin field game problem. So just remember it's for all times, a cumulative distribution, it's the cumulative of the distribution of agents in the mean field game system. In the plot in the middle, you have the solution, numerical solution obtained with this approach. And remember that in this approach, the variational problem you obtain is convex. 
So whenever you discretize in time and space, you obtain a finite dimensional convex optimization problem. So the numerical solution is basically trivial because you can use any package to obtain this result. And as you see on the third plot, the agreement between them is, is good. We have some error here at the end, which is somehow uh, expected because in these kind of optimal control problems, when you are the closer you are to the finite time horizon, the less benefit you get for, from a good approximation of, of your problem because the cost redu is reduced in this short time horizon that, that is remaining to finish uh, the terminal time. In the left bottom plot, you see the analytical solution for the distribution of players. So basically it's the derivative of the cumulative. Just to highlight that as we knew, because the initial condition is compactly supported, then this function is compactly supported for all times. In the plot, um, the middle, you see the numerical approximation using this uh, cumulative from the previous plot. And again, you have a good agreement, but of course, here, of course here, you are increasing your error because of the numerical differentiation. So another study that we plan to do is how you take the numerical differenti differentiation efficiently to reduce this error, because you can take a uh, three point stencil, let's say, or you can take several uh, points to uh, increase, decrease, sorry, the error in the approximation. More benchmarks on the left top, we have now the, the, the analytical solution of the potential when you take the derivative with respect to time. And again, if you compare to the numerical solution, here the error, of course, is increasing, but we are close enough. And from there on, you can build uh, the remaining elements in the mean field game. Here you see on the bottom the value function. We have a good agreement in the interior, but some errors uh, at the boundary, which is, uh, let's say, expected. And here you see the price. The issue with the numerical differentiation is that you lose some representation at the beginning. So we plan to, to fix that by considering a, a wider time horizon somehow that is going to allow you to compute the differentiation up to the initial time. Because remember that the price is given with a terminal condition. So when you take the numerical differentiation, you're going to lose the representation at the beginning. And we have a good agreement, but we still uh, want to improve this result because here the important feature is to retain the oscillatory behavior of the price. But as you see, we have some uh, phase uh, problem there that it's uh, somehow increasing by the middle of the time horizon. So we, we still want to improve uh, this result. Now I'm going to push a little bit this approach to include uh, a generalization of this model. So in another project, we consider the price formation when your supply is a stochastic process. This model generalizes the one introduced by Gomez and Saudi, because when you take here the volatility to be zero, you recover back the deterministic price formation problem. In this case, the mean field game system is much more challenging because you have additional terms in the mean field game solution. And actually the nature itself of the solutions is completely different. They are now stochastic processes. For instance, the measure now it's for every realization a distribution, but it's a stochastic process. This kind of mean field games is uh, not new in the sense that they belong to what is known as common noise. Here, the common noise comes from this Brownian motion. Uh, if you uh, have, uh, if, we, if we remember briefly, the noise in mean field games can be, um, be uh, among players can be independent. So when you take the mean field limit, it vanishes. 
But in this case, the noise in the supply does not vanish in the mean because it's perceived by all players. So it persists in the mean field limit, and that we obtain this kind of a mean game system. What we want to do now, sorry, I'm going back. What we want to do now is, uh, because of, of course, I'm not going to cover the analytical solution of these kind of systems, but how can we represent the solution of these systems with common noise? And for that, we want to use uh, what I introduced already, this variational approach. But we are also going to introduce uh, some machine learning uh, support. Just as a uh, brief result on the previous system, we study the final population gain, which is the usual path you do with these uh, systems. And then you study the corresponding mean field limit and the convergence. For instance, if you have a linear quadratic model, we show that you can actually obtain explicit solutions to this mean field game system by doing an extended space approach to the optimal control problem. So you consider not only a representative player, but also the mass, the population of, of players. You have this SD for the supply, and you assume that there is an SD for the price. And using uh, the balance constraint and some steps in between that, uh, that involve the hamilton jacob equation for the value function in this extended space, you can actually find the corresponding drift and volatility of the price to recover this SD. The nice feature about this stochastic model is that you can jump to real world applications. For instance, when you have energy supply coming from renewables, you know they are a stochastic process. There is uncertainty on how much energy you are going to get. Here in this plot, you see three different realizations of uh, the same process. This is real data. It corresponds to the price of energy in the Spanish market. The dashed curves is the real price, and the solid lines is the price you will have obtained if you use this mean field game approach. And we recover a property that was obtained in the model by Gomez and Sauj, which is the following. The price obtained with the mean field game system oscillates less than the real price. So you are reducing the uncertainty for the customer side. And that's what you want in this kind of problems. Because remember that this price formation setting has uh, an inspiration in this kind of pricing under load, uh, sorry, called load adaptive pricing, in which you want to have a real time price that is adapted to the current situation of the system. So here you are reducing actually the noise for the customer. What we want to do now is to encode this uh, variational problem that I showed you before for the stochastic case using neural networks. Because this plot you obtain, it's only for the linear quadratic case for which we can recover explicit solutions. But if you go outside of the linear quadratic case, then we have no, no way to represent the solutions of this mean field game with common noise. So we plan to use the potential approach and neural networks. Neural networks is going to replace this standard toolbox we use to solve finite dimensional convex optimization problem. The intuition is the following. Before we had only one supply because it was deterministic. And when we discretize the variational problem, it was a final dimensional convex problem, so we use a standard toolbox. But here, we don't want to solve the same problem over and over again for each realization of the supply. So for that, to encode the noise, we are going to use the neural networks. Just as a brief introduction, we use what is called recurrent neural networks. 
they are characterized by specifying a, a cell. In this cell, you have this usual matrix of weights, the vector of biases, you have the activation functions, but they also have what is called the hidden state. And the role of this hidden state is to uh, encode information that you use in the next iteration of your machine learning approach. On the right hand side, we see a diagram that maybe I'll, uh, allow, will allow me to explain how we implement this. The idea is the following. You are going to discretize in time, your time horizon, and in space. Because remember, we are working with an initial measure that is compactly supported and that allows to work in a compact set. You start with the initial time. You compute for all points in the grid with the neural network. And then when you move here to the next time step, let's say we are in k minus one, and one, now we move to time k. The role of the hidden state is to carry the information of the supply up to time k. And as you see here, we recognize here a property that is actually needed when you do a stochastic, uh, this kind of a stochastic processes, which is the progressively measurability of your solution. And that's actually what your neural network is giving, that if you are at time k, all the information you are using of your stochastic process, in this case, the supply, is all the time horizon up to time k, and you are not looking in the future. So you are somehow retaining that property that you do know must be satisfied in the analytic framework. Now we are going to introduce the penalization that you use in machine learning, basically the road in machine learning that you need a cost criteria that is going to be minimized with these gradient-based descent methods. And we have a uh, one, uh, the discretization of several uh, sources. The first one is the variational loss. Remember, we have this underlying variational problem, so you discretize in time and space, and this is the first uh, loss that you have for your machine learning approach. The next ones are penalty losses, because remember, our potential must satisfy certain conditions, so let's go one by one. The first one is guaranteeing that your potential, when you take the derivative with respect to x, behaves as a density, so it's non negative. The second one is guaranteeing the valence condition. So remember, we have this valence condition for the potential, and we enforce it here as a penalization, taking this expression. The next one is the initial condition, because remember, for the mean field gain, we have a given measure at time zero. And the last one is uh, guaranteeing us that the derivative with respect to x of the potential is a probability measure. Now we add all these losses, and that's the loss we use to train the neural network. And here you see some numerical results. I am simplifying the dynamics for the supply. They are not oscillating. This is just for the purpose of illustration. And here you see three different realizations of this process and the corresponding solution to the mean free game system. So here in the first plot on the left top, we have the potential. Now it's a stochastic process, and we have these three different realizations. On the right top, we have the derivative with respect to x, that remember is the density in the mean field game system. And here we see the nature of this solution. This process now is for all realizations of the supply, a probability measure. That's why we see here three densities. And on the bottom, we see the corresponding price for these three realizations. The solid lines is the co correspond to the analytical solution because remember in the linear quadratic setting, 
we have an explicit uh, solution. And the dashed curves is the approximation obtained using the neural networks. And as you see, we are approximating the noise quite well. In this plot, we see now the losses that I just introduced. This is just to highlight how they behave during the training of the neural network. So basically you have uh, some uh, iteration of the training. And as you see in this logarithmic plot, these losses are going to zero, which is exactly what we expect. Because remember, they are penalizing the conditions that the potential must satisfy. So you need them to be as close as zero as possible. And we obtain that. Of course, there is some noise, as you see here, because remember, you are training against a stochastic process. So just to wrap up the presentation, what we did was to take a mean field game system from price formation that has not only the value function and the density, but also a price variable. And we reduced the solution of this mean field game system, both analytically and numerically, to a convex optimization problem with constraints. In the deterministic case, the solution of this problem is quite easy because it's a finite dimensional problem. So you can use a standard toolbox. And in the stochastic case, we were able to use neural networks to encode, encode the, no, the dependence on the noise. So that's all, all I have for today. I thank you once again for the invitation. And of course, I will be very happy to discuss 